want to talk to you about um, about sadness and grief. Um, I met someone recently who lost their spouse unexpectedly a year ago. And uh, they're sad, grieving. And, <clears throat> and I thought about the last two years and eight months of my life, two years and eight months that I have been grieving. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I hope that this person will be my friend because we're sort of in the same place, uh, going through the same thing. And it's loss, sadness grief, loss, and you don't know what to do. Mm, so there's like a million things you can try, a million different articles talking about, you know, how to get past it, like how to process it. Seven stages of grief, acceptance, um, replacing the empty spaces with something else. But I want to tell you, it is not as easy as one would think. Because, you know, when all is said and done, it takes a long period of time to accept it, process it, let it go. To sit beside it, name it, and say, hello my friend Grief, come to sit with me for a while. And you don't want to get stuck, then you get that prolonged grief syndrome they talk about, that complex grief, complicated grief, it has all these different names. It's in the DSM book of disorders, and it's real, it's a real thing. So I recently announced to you guys that um, I'm moving to California. And it's been something I had planned to do for the last 40 years. And my narcissistic psychopath husband, ex-husband, he co-opted that and went within a couple of months after he, after the discard, after he, um, cast me to the side and in an extremely brutal, cruel and heartless way, uh, he went there. <laughs> Which, you know, it's not like, oh, insult upon injury. It was just, you know, a, there's so many things that increase the magnitude of that betrayal. Um, the suddenness, thinking that he was my life partner, he was my lobster, and I was never gonna have to date again or be in a position where I was gonna have to even think about, um, you know, replacing him or being alone or anything like that because I thought I was always gonna have him until I wasn't. So, um, what do I wanna tell you about that? <clears throat> um, Recovery from narcissistic abuse looks nothing like recovery from a regular relationship. And those of you who are experiencing it, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there's no way to really explain it to you unless it happens to you or someone you know. Um, because it's unfathomable what you go through or why or trying to learn about it to understand what is going on with you. I think there's different phases. Like you have to learn what is narcissism, what was the dynamics of the relationship itself, the mutual psychosis, why you were vulnerable and why you stayed when you should have left, um, why you ignored the red flags, why you, you know, entered into that. Uh, but, you know, in a way that's kind of asking, like, why does the fly get trapped in the spider web, <laughs> you know? 
you blame the fly? No, you don't. Um, you know, they're just coming along and the spider it catches it in its beautiful, sparkly, glittery, beautiful web and then wraps it in silk and then injects it with poison and something to paralyze it. And it never knew what hit it. I mean, this poor fly, have you ever thought about that? They, they just fly, they don't see it coming. They're stuck in the web before they even know they're stuck. And then they're mummified, wrapped up and injected with this drug that makes it to where they're, they can't move, they're paralyzed. That's exactly what happened to us. So to say, to say things like, well, we were party to it because we didn't leave. A healthy person would have left. Yeah, that's, that's quite possibly correct. And at least in the majority of cases, I think that there's truth in that. But, you know, you can't blame the victim. And I'm not saying that, the, that we're victims. I, I reject that. I'm not a victim. I was a volunteer. I was like, take me, take me, choose me to, to you know, Mr. Spider, <laughs> take me. I'm a volunteer. Um, I did that. Yep. And, uh, and so he did take me for 16 years and fed off of me and was very sweet to me to keep me like wrapped up like that in the web and keeping me alive so that um, I could provide these things that he needed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it is it's um, is different from other kinds of abuse and um, it's different from other kinds of relationships and what happens to you in the aftermath is just different because you've been hollowed out being trapped in that web and being siphoned off of your life force for all that time. Even though you willingly gave it away, still, you know, they fed off of you until you're empty. And when they have pissed in their pond and contaminated things so much that you're not much use anymore because you're kind of broken, then they, then they replace you. And then what happens and after that is so horrific that, you know, because it's spiritual, it's existential, it's your identity, it's your brain has been co-opted, it's your neurochemicals in your brain, it's physiological, it's trauma in the body, it's a spiritual betrayal, it's an energetic, depletion it is a emotional dysregulation <laughs> i could just keep going that doesn't happen in a regular breakup i had a regular breakup this is my second marriage with the narcissist so i'd already had one go at a marriage with another person who had some issues but i mean the breakup was a normal breakup i think it took about 14 months of a lot of crying and depression and anger and going through all those steps and it was like mourning the death of a marriage and it was hard it's really hard it was the first time that i showed up in therapy first time i reached out for help because i knew i needed it but after a year had passed i was on the mend uh, i think it was 14 months later that i emerged from my house and actually had a date with another person <laughs> and uh, i went on I went on with my life and and um, in fact he came back and said he had made a mistake and that he was sorry and that he wanted to take me back and I said no I can't do that because for the last year and a half I have grieved you and I um, put you away you know and my feelings shut down and gradually I let go of them and I and I don't love you anymore and I don't have those feelings anymore and you broke my heart over a year ago and I have processed that and I'm on the other side of it and I don't feel that way anymore it's you know I don't feel that way anymore and I can't go back and retrieve those feelings because I have released them I have uh, they have faded and that's how normal things go 
this thing with the narcissist. It's not normal. It's not normal. And what they do to you, not normal. And how you feel when it's over, not normal. So the person I met today was not tangled up with a narcissist. This, this person was a regular spouse. And, um, but still the grieving um, is the same in the sense that, you know, we're both sad. We both have experienced loss. But you know, beyond that, <laughs> it's like, uh, the other things that happen are pretty distinctively different. So I just want to name that so that you know. And for the people who don't believe, those people who tell you, oh, you know, uh, what I'm experiencing is really terrible, and, um, you know, you gotta believe me when I say that, you know, it's different, I've never felt this way before, it's a horrible thing. You gotta believe them, because they aren't telling you a story. I mean, it's, it's, it's for real. This, it is for real. And um, so I'm leaving. And the purpose of the leaving is to reclaim some humanity, dignity, zest for life, hope, um, identity. After two years and eight months, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I'm, I'm ready to um, try to individuate. That is what needs to happen. I need to identify separate, whatever headspace I still give to my narcissist's ex-husband, I have to reclaim that headspace and push him out and say, no, you don't get free rent here, buddy. <laughs> Move along. Because, you know, they're in your head. It's, they're an intraject. Um, there's all kinds of research, factual, statistical explanations for what I have experienced and am still experiencing. And I cannot afford to allow him to continue to be an inner voice. I need my own inner voice. And if I want to have God provide an inner voice for me as well, that's my choice, my decision. And I'm going to do that because I have agency over myself. I don't need external validation. I don't need my attachment to this narcissist to be able to view myself, to love myself. I don't need to be parentified where I'm functioning as someone's mother. Someone's mother that is a reenactment of childhood archaic wounds is what they're called when they're wounds from childhood that they're bringing this trolley, this this cart, just stacked tall to the sky with, with all kinds of negative things that they harbor against their original parent that did something just, you know, horrific to them. They bring that when they parentify the partner. I'm talking about the narcissist when they do that to you. They bring all their archaic wounds, childhood, drama and disappointments and all of that anger, contempt, revulsion. They bring all that big mess and they, they dump it on your lap. They have to punish you. They have to eventually devalue you and they have to eventually abandon you and try to kill you, you know, um, because they're punishing you and they want you dead because you have been bad. And you're playing that role of their uh, parent. I myself have done the same thing which led me to my codependency and my dependency disorder. I have done the same thing wanting to be um, being parented and the weird thing about relationships with narcissists they don't just parentify. A lot of times their partner parentifies them so they're playing both father and child too their partner. I'm talking about the narcissist. They are the parent and they are the child. So, wow, what a dynamic, <laughs> what a cluster, you know what, of crazy. But anyway, I'm going. I'm leaving here in just a few months. 
Um, and, and I feel like it, it's something I have to do. It's the right thing to do to get the memories that are all around me here. Even the furniture, I'm letting it all go. I sold the house, now I gotta sell any other remnant that remains to wash it away, to erase it. Because these indelible, imprinted things that live on with me are unacceptable. They're, they are joy killers. They are tormentors that will remain indefinitely unless I actively purge them. And to do that, I need to go new place, new people, new job, new life, new self, all of it. Um, and perhaps my new friend who has also had a loss, even though it's not the same kind of loss, it's still loss. And so we can respect that space with one another and support each other. And uh, hopefully that's gonna be a good thing. Um, we need support from people like that, you know? Um, so even though I'm leaving, hopefully this is a new friend that um, will be part of my life in some way for some time to come. You never know how things are gonna work out, right? Uh, we just know that we come into a time where we look at our condition of our lives and we say, you know, hey, something's gotta give. I'm tired of being sad. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of being tormented by the past, intrusive thoughts, all of that, you know? You have to, at some point, in recovery, take the bold initiative to just completely begin again, begin anew. So that's what I'm gonna do, guys. <laughs> uh, that's what I hope to do. And um, wish me luck. I'm probably gonna need it, but you know, I think it's gonna be an adventure. And I think it's gonna be good. And I'm excited and um, yeah, that's what I think. And I wanted to share a few of these little things with you today. Um, I have focused a lot on, you know, on my writings on Medium and on my podcast, which come from the writings. I have more research-based academic kind of approach with personal stories sprinkled in there. But my YouTube channel is more just sort of like personal ramblings. And there's several reasons I do it. I want you, those of you experiencing this, to acknowledge, to recognize that you're not alone, that there's other people experiencing the exact same thing for the exact same reason. And it's very textbook normal kind of recovery from being tangled up with a narcissist for a partner. Uh, number two, I don't want you to have to feel like you're alone. I felt very alone. I didn't know what was happening to me when this started back in June of 2019. Um, I was scared. I was, um, I was so lost for a while. I had figured it out myself. I didn't know what resources to get to and it was months before I found some and I found support groups and I found things online. Um, I want to be one of those resources to help people. Um, and there's other reasons too. Um, I, I just want people not to feel alone and to understand what's happening. And I guess more than anything, I want to put this out there to the public to be uh, educational, to be public awareness, to be enlightenment, because there's so much misunderstanding and disinformation about narcissism and about what recovery looks like following that. There's so much stuff out there that's just wrong. Um, and there's so many things that people, they're just ignorant about. And I want to educate the masses. I want everybody to understand narcissism and narcissistic abuse recovery. I want them to understand that just like they do ADHD or um, like some of the other major mental health issues that everybody knows about, you know, depression, suicidal ideation, um, anorexia and bulimia, eating disorders, you know, I want it to be understood like that. Not just words where everybody says, narcissist, 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 in a very reckless and haphazard way. I want them to stop that and to really understand it and to take it seriously and not make it pop psychology term of the day but to really understand the gravity of it as a serious 
mental health issue and give it the respect it deserves and have the understanding that it deserves, just like these other illnesses that have become mainstream. Everybody understands what it is to have diabetes, to have high blood pressure. You understand why, why it happens, what you did to contribute to it, what you can do to regulate it, all that. You understand it. And I want, I guess I do this because I want people to understand this in a similar way. <laughs> yep. Um, so let's keep going, guys. And I will see you soon.